What does the Bible say about menstruation? This is quite an odd topic to be covered on this specific YouTube channel and by a man. I hear what you're saying, YouTube watcher, and you're not wrong. But I think it's worth addressing when you have verses like Leviticus 15, 19, which reads, Whenever a woman has her menstrual period, she will be ceremonially unclean for seven days. Anyone who touches her during that time will be unclean until the evening. So on its face, this sounds at best a little insulting. And it could also make it seem like periods are something to be ashamed of. I mean, other things on the list of being unclean include people with leprosy, certain dead bodies and animal carcasses, human corpses, bones, and graves. So what's the deal here? Is this just a sign of the times, written in an era where women were seen as less than men and oppressed due to their gender? What is God's intention here? And what does the Bible have to say? Let's take a look. Attention, bargain shoppers. So I've heard it said about many of the commands, especially those in the book of Leviticus, things that seem strange to us today have more to do with God's protection from disease. The idea being that people at the time didn't have an understanding of germ theory, and so God didn't want them touching certain things or eating certain things because it could make them sick. And although this may have been a side effect of that, this was not the primary reason for those commands. You see, the laws in Leviticus were ceremonial laws. And through these, God wanted to communicate his mercy, his holiness to his people. But let's back up for a second. What does it mean to be clean or not clean? I mean, one sounds good and one sounds bad, but we as Christians today don't even really have a frame of reference for what that means. What is God trying to say here? Well, when you hear book of Leviticus, you can think to yourself set of instructions. The Jewish people called them laws, but these are things God laid out for the ancient Israelites. And they served two main functions. So number one, they served as God's instruction to ancient Israel on daily practices and how to live. So number one, they're instructional. And the second function was to define the life of the people of God under the administration of Moses. So you've got a practical aspect and a theological aspect to this. The practical aspect was to keep the people of God set apart from the nations which surrounded them. The people who lived in that region had their own identities. They were tribal, they were warlike, they engaged in cutting of the flesh and child sacrifices and just brutal religious practices. God was giving his people their own identity. And it was a spiritual identity, a holy identity. God wanted everybody to look at this nation, the Israelites, see how they were living, see the standards that they held themselves to, and say, wow, those are God's chosen people. In Deuteronomy 4, 6, it explains, Observe them carefully, referring to the laws, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. But these instructions were just arbitrary rules. There was a theological aspect to them. God was using these to teach his people about God, about himself, and about themselves and their relationship to him. We get some clues to this when we look at Leviticus 10, 10 through 11, so that you can distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean, so that you can teach the Israelites all the decrees the Lord has given them through Moses. So here we're told that the differences between clean and unclean isn't good and bad. It's between holy and common. The theological purpose behind this was to be a constant reminder to the Jewish people through their everyday actions about God and about sin and the process of forgiveness. It was to show a picture of our relationship with God, with their lives as the canvas. Uncleanliness was not a sin, it was a picture of sin, a reminder of sin. So it was almost impossible with these laws to get through even a day in Israel without becoming unclean and some form or another. The Lord, in turn, is showing that sin is just something that regularly corrupts human life on a day-to-day -day basis. The hope 
is not to escape being unclean. The hope is to be delivered from it. The law was never meant to be this burden that people were constricted by. The whole point is that it is impossible to stay clean without God's help. So in order to come to God's presence, it was this constant rituals of becoming unclean through daily life, taking steps to make ourselves clean through sacrifice, through doing the things God commands. So with that understanding in mind, let's get back to periods. It's hard to say that with a straight face. So first I'm going to mention that the Bible talks about both female and male bodily discharges making us unclean. And I want to emphasize again that unclean isn't bad. It's symbolic. So what I mean by this is, let's take childbirth, for example. Pain related to childbirth and things of that nature are meant to remind us of the fall of man. If we look at Genesis 3, 16, it reads, To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. So for the Old Testament law, things having to do with procreation, sex, childbearing, periods, these were all things that pointed back to sin. They were symbolic throwbacks to an earlier time. Reminders of sin in the world. I mean, none of these things are bad. Sex isn't some dirty act. I mean, God created it. Having kids isn't sinful. Not at all. Jesus even tells us later in Mark that it's not things on the outside that make us unclean. It's really what's in the heart that makes us spiritually unclean. So whether we're talking about childbirth or labor pains or menstrual cycles, the Bible is not and never was saying that there's something bad or to be ashamed of. It was merely symbolic for that specific group of people during that time to show them that we as people are sinful and our hope is in God's deliverance. In Hebrew chapter 9, it reads, The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. So that's all I have for you today. I hope you found that interesting. I'm going to leave the scripture in the description below that I used today. If you liked the video, please feel free to leave a comment, like, and subscribe. I do read them all, but it takes me a minute sometimes to respond. My name is Adam. This is Bargain Bin Theology. And remember, you get what you pay for.